My name is Katrina Norbell, and I am assistant professor here in the MPA and MS Leadership Program. And we want to welcome you to our 10th Public Service and Leadership Conference, number 10. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to my colleague, esteemed Dr. Michael Hall, who is going to direct our program today and um, give you some information about what we've been doing over the last 10 years and welcome everyone. Dr. Hall. Thank you, uh, Dr. Norvell. Welcome everyone. We're so pleased that uh, you're all here with us for the 10th anniversary of the uh, Public Service and Leadership Conference. You know, we started this uh, whole process largely because I got a letter or a call, I don't remember exactly which, from the uh, National Office in uh, Washington, D.C. from ASPA saying, if you don't do something, we're going to take your money away. <laughs> and I turned to my then assistant, Ann Wolf Lawson, and I said, we're, we have an ASPA checker? <laughs> she said, well, yeah. <laughs> well, nobody told me. So uh, we began putting together some events and uh, trying to be busy. And it really got underway in about 2009 or so, as our anniversary logo indicates. And um, what we were trying to do was integrate the MPA and ultimately the MS in Leadership programs um, into RIASPA, since it was centered at Roger Williams. And um, we tried to then m make themes to develop out of, uh, out of the, for each conference. And eventually what happened was, those themes started to involve the Pawtucket High School Academies. Now that was largely because of the gentleman sitting to my immediate right, Michael Conlon. Mr. Conley, would you stand for a moment? It was Mr. Connolly's brainchild to create the academies and use um, federal money, Carl Perkins' money, to do it. And we started having the students come to my classes in the beginning. And ultimately, I said, you know, Michael, we need to get these folks really more involved. And so we began to, buy, to design some projects for them to do. They began to be part of the ASPA conference that we have every May, and they're here this afternoon, or this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, can you acknowledge? There they are. So about 2015, we began to focus more on themes, and we have done themes such as innovation. Um, the uh, students from the academies did uh, con um, community asset mapping. Um, I even had one year the uh, the students use uh, the software called SketchUp to redesign their classrooms to be more interactive and to yield a better learning environment for them. Um, that was all kinds of uh, STEM work. The uh, students um, have um, recently done posters and we have a poster presentation for us uh, from them later this morning. Now none of this of course could happen without the uh, assistance of, of a, a number of people. And I'd like to recognize, if we could, Dr. Katrina Norvell has right here. <laughs> Dr. Norvell is, is a, a creative person, and she really has helped redefine some of our um, themes over the years. And we welcomed her in 2015? No, 2013. 2013. I'm an old person, I forget. <laughs> Um, as soon as last year's conference was over, Lee Ku immediately began working on this year's conference. And we wouldn't be sitting here without uh, Ms. Ku. Here she is. Um, there are countless hours that she's put in. Um, she's done work in the, on the weekends, overnight. She has been um, the real spark plug to make this thing work. So, Lee, thank you very, very much. I'd like to recognize some very special guests, without whom much of what we do wouldn't be possible. They have provided support in ways that, when we started this back in the uh, 2008, 9, whenever it was, 
um, I could not imagine. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, the current president of ASPA National, Dr. Paul Danzig. Uh, Dr. Danzig comes off, uh, to us from the West Coast, so he flew in yesterday and it was a long trip, but he's here. This marks his third visit with us, and we are so pleased that he comes. He has been more than supportive um, throughout um, the last three years when he's come to our conferences. I uh, also want to recognize uh, William Shields, Jr. <laughs> Known to most of us as Bill. He's a native Rhode Islander, you know. And uh, that is fortuitous for us because uh, that made one of the connections that uh, Mr. Connolly and I were able to work with him on um, to get some uh, work done for the, with the academies. And um, a person who has, she set a record now for the number of visits she's made uh, to uh, Rhode Island, both as uh, president-elect and president, and she's no longer president, but she keeps coming because she's supportive and she believes in what we do. Ladies and gentlemen, Janice Lachance. I've asked all three of those folks to make some remarks later about our theme, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, 12.30ish, Ms. Koo. A longtime friend of the program um, is um, my good buddy, Dr. Archie Morris. <laughs> Dr. Morris has come to these since we started back in 2008. And uh, he's been a loyal supporter, and he's always been uh, helpful. He's even made presentations for us. Even though he's retired, um, he keeps coming, and uh, we're very appreciative of, of his uh, support for us. Now, we will be hearing shortly from our keynote speaker, but I thought we might take a look at her before she begins. Sermina Breland. More about her soon. Um, but importantly, this morning we have a very special guest. Uh, she and I go back to the 150 Washington Street location. Um, it's back in the 2010 or so. Um, and she was as friendly and delightful as she is right now and has always been helpful to us. And her, her career has moved her into the public sphere. She is a public servant now. And she is Secretary of State, Nellie Corbea. She is a record-setting individual. She is the first um, Hispanic woman elected to statewide office in New England. She's a proven leader, taking on tough issues and getting results. She was reelected to serve a second term in the office of Secretary of State, November 6, 2018. As Secretary of State, she has promoted increased civic engagement and government accessibility. Her involvement with civic engagement connects directly to our conference, and we are pleased to have her here to give us some remarks. Ms. Gorbea. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hall. It's in, good morning, buenos dias. It's wonderful to be here with all of you here at the ASPA, uh, and, and greetings, of course, to President-elect Paul Danzig, and also to Executive Director William Shields. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and let's give a round of applause to this amazing leader, Dr. Michael Hall, because every, every gathering needs a good organizing leader who's doing a fantastic job as director of the Master's in Public Administration program at Roger Williams University. Um, you know, I'm, I'm particularly pleased to be with all of you here because as a fellow MPAer and somebody who actually did public policy in her undergraduate degree, you know, I, I feel that we share a bond, uh, that, that we share something that, let's face it, our other colleagues that went to law school, they went to business school, they went to other programs. They don't have what we have in terms of this real deep down commitment to making government work for everyone. 
that you know I, I remember going from pub, my undergraduate years to my to figure out where I was going to go for graduate school and yeah I looked at law school I, I actually I think I took the LSATs twice uh, I looked at business school for about five minutes uh, and then said no that's not really how I want to see the world I want to look at it from the point of view of making government work for everyone and the and, and how it's structured and how we can make changes and and so that's why actually I ran for Secretary of State eventually and and why I'm excited super excited about your theme this year of civic engagement um, you know the people in this room know better than probably many others uh, how important it is to get Rhode Islanders or anybody involved with their government it changes the way things work and the biggest battle that we have is against this ongoing message from the media from all sorts of places that your participation in government doesn't really matter it does it absolutely does and you all are looking at case studies in your work that show how it does for example for me being in um in, in public office has really allowed me to do things like eliminating barriers and improving access to the ballot box with legislation and creating online and automated voter registration because people can't vote if they're not registered and so how do you make it easier for people to actually do that uh, for you high school students here in the back <laughs> um, you know those laws might help some of your own peers and we talked a little bit before the breakfast I mean before the, the speaking program started about you know online voter registration I know you're all on your phones I've got a couple of teenagers at home uh, if if you know before I, I got elected you pretty much had to either go to a desktop or you had to print out a form and fill it out I, I've had young people look at me with like what what's a PDF you know um, or how do I send this in I mean, what are those blue boxes on street corners? If we don't change the way government works, then we are basically leaving people out of democracy. And so I do want to give a particular shout out uh, to the students and to the teachers and the staff over at Shea and Tolman High Schools um, for being the only high school in the nation to become members of the ASPL. Let's give them a, a big round of applause. And, and this is a really active bunch. I had already talked to a few of them in my office. Uh, I had some of the Tolman High School students come with their teacher, Tim Howe. They had ideas on how the activity book that the Department of State puts out could be improved to incorporate math into the, into the, the structure of it. And I said, you know, we, in our office, we're pretty good. We hadn't thought about that. And thank you for bringing that forward. And yeah, we're gonna actually do that. We're gonna incorporate math now into the activity guide that is about history and civics because we hadn't thought about the STEAM approach and when we put that together. And that would not be happening had it not been for students at uh, Pawtucket High Schools that came forward and brought that forward. And you know, this is a really active generation. In fact, they're definitely making their voices heard. In Rhode Island alone, there was a 64% increase in voters ages 18 through 20 compared to the 2014 election, something that gives happiness and hope to my day. Uh, and I hope that your peers will continue this momentum because we absolutely need those young voices. And while the future is really bright, you can also look to our past for civic engagement. And so one of the things that I've been doing as Secretary of State is to increase the visibility of our state archives. In those archives, and we have almost 400 years of documents of how government was structured in the beginning here. We have examples of how Rhode Island, general Rhode Island citizens have changed the course of history. And so for example, this Saturday, May 4th, for those of you from out of town, May 4th is actually uh, the anniversary of the Act of Renunciation. Rhode Island, not anywhere else, Rhode Island was the first colony to renounce allegiance to the King of England. So whatever you hear or read in other boards elsewhere, that's not how it started. It started here in Rhode Island. And, and so our, our state archives are that place where you can look at the act of renunciation, you can look at these things, but we're the only state in the country that doesn't have an actual facility 
for uh, for these amazing records. And so I'm on a mission to uh, bring an actual Rhode Island State Archives and Rhode Island History Exhibition Center to our state, right across from the State House. And so I hope all of you will join me in encouraging your legislators and the governor uh, to find us a real home for these. Uh, because we really can't move forward without learning from our past. Or at least we can't move in an effective way. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, have a really wonderful, productive day. And I'm looking forward to seeing some of these students back in my office again and keep giving me these great ideas. Thank you so much. Now, Ms. Gorbea, before you take off, oh. and I know you're busy, but after a special vote, the members of ASPA and the board have made you a member of the American That's Society cool. of Public Administration. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I don't have to, thank you so much. I, uh, I look forward to wearing my thing with Paul. Um, I've got to say that uh, the American Society of Poor Public Administration was founded on much of the theme that uh, Secretary of State Gorbea just touched on, and uh, some of the words that she used were exactly in my head when I thought, what should I do with my career, and it was, I want to make government work better. She said, make it work for, for everyone. But I think I would not be out of line if I said the founders pretty much had that same sort of thing in mind in 1939. Now, I want to make a, um, another recognition or two. I think this is important since they were definitely involved in this theme and putting together the program for this year. I'd like to ask the members of the current Rye Aspa board to stand as I call your name, please. Vice President Katrina Norvell, Treasurer Lee Koo, who is in and out, uh, Aaron Chesky, Council member George Labonte, council member Christopher Pierce and Sasha Zapata. These are the uh, long serving council members. Added this spring um, are Lexi Brown. Is she she's still at the desk? Um, Linda DeMorenville and Ryan Sherry. Please help me thank and welcome all of them. And now, for the uh, keynote speech. Um, a year ago when we were discussing as a council who would be the keynote address for the civic engagement theme, before I could say anything else, the name Serena Breland was mentioned at the council table. Serena is currently the city manager of Pflugerville, Texas. Ms. Breland, has a bachelor's of business administration from Stephen F. Austin University, State University in Nacogdoches, Texas. She has a master's of public affairs from the University of Texas at Dallas. She, of course, is a Texan. I think you will find that she and I share the Texan kind of, um, what's the direct approach? Yeah. <laughs> we, say, we say rodeo. Not rodeo. I don't know what they say. We say rodeo. Uh, Ms. Breland has actually been in the academic field, despite the fact that she tries to uh, not acknowledge that. She's taught government, economics, and world history at the high school level uh, in Garland and Mesquite, Texas. She began her career in local government in 2003 as the city manager of Green Greenville, Texas, as we say back home, not Greenville, Greenville, Texas. Um, she uh, was named one of the top five public servants in 2012 by the Victoria Advocate based recommendations for community leaders. And I could go on and on, but among the things I would do in the on and on is she goes to Oklahoma football games <laughs> and sits on the 35 yard line in a chair back seat. Ladies and gentlemen, my new good friend, Serena Breel. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Wow, 10 years, quite an accomplishment. Dr. Hall has run an amazing 
organization here. I'm so proud to be here. Um, the people in this room, I know you've all been recognized, but I tell you that I, I came in yesterday, my first time to Rhode Island, uh, and so if anyone can, she left. I could have been an honorary Rhode Islander, I think. <laughs> I heard from this table that y'all say the word, I say y'all. I'm going to say y'all about 50 times today. Okay. And, but I heard you say use. Is that correct? Use? I don't understand that. <laughs> but I'll, I'll work on it today. So today I ask that you take what you like and leave the rest. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my journey. I've learned that, uh, so I'm going to change it up a little bit today, but I, I want to share with young people in the room a little bit about my journey in, in becoming a city manager. I know that when I sat in the high school classroom, I never thought, gee, I think I'm going to be a city manager. That never crossed my mind. And as I knew as a young person that I love public service, et cetera, it's been able to um, be a, a, a transition that I wasn't able to make and didn't know about um, when I was in high school and made that transition later. So I can't wait to talk about that. Um, I, Dr. Hall and Lee, where's Lee? Lee, amazing. I met Lee last year with Chris Pierce uh, when we were in Denver um, and just uh, put Rhode Island on the map for me. They said, would you ever come to Rhode Island? I said, yes. And I thought they were, I just really dismissed it. They're like, well, we're going to have you. And I thought, oh, that's cute. I'll never hear that again. <laughs> and then so many months later, here we are having a conversation. So thank you. Um, for, for Paul, for being here, thank you. That's an amazing journey. Bill, the work that you do as executive director is amazing. Janice, the work that you've done for years. I'm very grateful for what y'all do in Archie. Thank you for being here. Uh, for the people that I've met, from uh, Cassidy, Ms. Flanagan, I know that we'll be honoring you today. I'm so thrilled. Where did Josh go? Josh? Remember, in your new journey, that you get to tell people, boy, it's so good that we're here to fix your problems. When you talk to those residents, and you know, I am fortunate to be able to serve. I hope that you do a great job. And you. You're welcome. Um, for my table, thank you for putting up with me for the last 30 minutes. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Ms. Ms. Garvey, she, had that she left, but I'll tell you, she gets it. You heard it. You heard where we meet people where they are. She gets it. That you should be grateful for having someone that's elected that gets that. I think that's very important. Now she said that uh, Rhode Island was the first to renounce allegiance. I would just tell you, Texas has renounced allegiance to anyone, like pretty much anyone. So I decided that when she spoke about that, I thought I should make a museum of some sort that says Texas should be its own country. That's what we believe in Texas. So I just want to put that out there that we have renounced. I'll leave it for so congratulations, Rhode Island, but I tell you, when you just tell everybody to go take a hike, you're, you're a Texan. <laughs> Michael, your work with the academies, it is jaw-dropping. I, I have nothing like it. Um, I started my career as a high school teacher. Um, I wanted to teach government. Um, and as more I got into it and realized that at the local level, they really only taught federal and state uh, where I was. There was no local government. So I gathered all my students, and we went to the city council meeting. Went to the city council meeting at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and my students were appalled by it. They said, how do the working people, you know, how are they able to, to do this? Um, so I allowed one of them to do public comment, because otherwise it's like open night night, you know? <laughs> and so uh, the, the students went up and they spoke about that, the inability to, to reach residents. Today in Mesquite, Texas, their meetings are in the evenings. It, it's amazing what a group of people do. What you've done is, is, is absolutely remarkable. So thank you all for being here. Um, Kind of, I have to have a, I have a Lee, you know, you'll have to hold my hand. You know that, right? Well, we say howdy in Texas. So if I say howdy, will you say howdy back? Howdy. 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 Oh, that was pretty good. good. Thank you. Very good. So that's what we did. I'll tell you, in the presence of all y'all, it truly, truly warms my heart. Um, but but I'll, I'll tell you more importantly, is that you've got me all excited to talk about civic engagement. Uh, there's probably two other topics that I'd like to talk about more. That would be tacos and music. And what's great about community engagement is that I usually get to bring in tacos and music. So this makes me very, very excited to be here. And you'll help me do things? Yeah. Yes. That's right. So I'll tell you a little story. I'm the daughter of a retired Fulberg colonel that was a chaplain. So if you understand what that means, I'm half preacher's kid and half army brat. What that means for young people is 20 years of therapy. That, that's, that's what ends up happening when you have a father, when you come home late, and my father would say, drop your guinea 20 and read the King James. And that's kind of, that's what we did in my household. 
And being a, a common Texan father, my father bought me a 22 rifle when I was 10 years old. I really think he bought it for himself, but we're just going to say that he bought it for me for the sake of the story. My grandfather had a ranch in Farmersville, Texas. Yep, that's the name of it, Farmersville, Texas. So in Farmersville, Texas, we would put up the beer cans from the night before, right, from Grandpa. And so while he slept it off, we put the beer cans up on a fence. And my father decided to teach me how to shoot a 22 rifle. And in doing so, my father was a very meticulous man, very, very, uh, very meticulous. We, you know, we had to make our beds every morning, et cetera. That's why I asked my parents to buy me one of those trundle beds, and you just roll it out, roll it back in. So I was, I was engineer, engineer. I had good um, ways of doing things when I was younger, and, and pretty smart on cutting some of those corners. So my father takes me out to shoot my first pain. Very meticulous in his training. You, you raise the firearm, how you breathe, how you sight it in. He even would talk to me about the ethics of if you shoot something that is living, what would you do then and to have a plan? And I distinctly remember being terrified, just absolutely being terrified of this. So I, I finally, he kneels down next to me. I raise that firearm and I go to shoot it. Sight it in, I'm breathing, I'm doing everything right. And I remember I lowered that weapon and I said, Dad, man, I looked at him and said, I'm, I'm scared. <clears throat> and he looked at me and said, baby, you just do it scared. And that's just one of those stories of shaping from then on that I realized that, what is it, we're born with two fears? Fear of, fear of loud noises, fear of unfollowing. And then we create how many fears we have. Anybody scared of spiders? What, right? Uh, monsters in the ocean, obviously <laughs> a thing. Um, and all those fears that we do, fear of public speaking, Fear that somebody's going to make fun of us. Whatever that fear is. And I'll tell you, my dad, very early, very simple words said, baby, you just do it scared, right? So I'll tell you, we, we all have these stories that shape us. I urge you to not focus on one story. I urge you to think about your life in a series of stories and how that shapes you. Excuse me. So we got this working? Yeah, yeah, good. Have you seen, what's that movie with the, uh, the clown guy? Uh, Batman, Spider-Man? Joker. Whenever he walks away from that hospital and blows it up. Anyways, I just realized this. Thank you. So a little bit about what I've done. Started as a high school teacher. I uh, recognized that I didn't want to be teaching government. I wanted to do government. I then did this huge leap of faith and just quit my job, sold my car, got roommates, uh, got a Ford Focus. That's what you do whenever... Things are really rough. No. <laughs> you buy Ford Focus and you go to your master's. When I was an MPA student, I have to share this with you. Usually, us city managers are very apolitical. Um, we, we don't pick sides. In Texas, it's a little difficult, but that's another story. So in, uh, when I was doing my master's, in, uh, it, I was about to finish. It was 2004. There, or no, I, anyways, it was before 2004. I had a sticker on my car. I have to admit, I had a sticker on my car. I don't know if everything it or not, so I don't know. But I'm just going to share this with you. This years ago, years ago, I had a sticker on my car that said, anybody but Bush 2004. That, that, that's what it said, okay? And so the, one of the deans of the, um, the university saw it and apparently thought it was hilarious, right? So he ended up offering me an urban fellowship position. And that's why it's always very dear for me, is that they ended up paying for school as soldier at Ford Focus. And I got a job um, doing 20 hours a week for minimum wage, actually, was my very first gig. And long story short, I, I, my career is about networking. My career is about making change, making, making significant changes in organizations. So I started there, then I went and worked at the city of Denton, and I was the recycling coordinator. But let me be clear, I worked at the landfill. We're supposed to say the sanitary landfill. I just called it a dump. And so I went from my master's to the dump. My parents were proud. Um, and, and, and started my career also at, at a dump. Um, I did meet Willie Nelson there and Ted Kennedy Jr. But anyways, other stories. Um, <laughs> random, I know. Uh, then I go to the city of uh, 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 Sugarland. If you know, if you know Texas at all, it's a large, um, it, it's a large suburb. Uh, it's known to be a high affluent area. So I was in Sh Sugarland. I was over facilities, fleet, uh, and whatever the city manager didn't want to do. So I had like the most random, like custodial, and they just kept adding. At that time, my my city manager, my assistant city manager, excuse me. Karen Daly, she said, uh, she works for ICMA now. She's in fun time. Right? Anyways, she tossed me out of the nest, and she said, you need to go be a city manager. And so I knew at that time, it was I knew early on it was my calling to do so when I entered my master's. And so what you do in a, in a uh, 
in that career path is I took a $50,000 pay cut to go be a city manager. So I was a director at a large city, and then I went and found this little town called Goliad, Texas. And if you look up Goliad, Texas, it's one of the strongest historical cities um, in Texas, and uh, population 1,700. So I was like the new shiny object, right, in town. So it was like right in high school. So uh, that's where I had to get a wastewater license and all sorts of stuff, because literally when you run a town and you have nine employees, you become the animal control officer, the wastewater plant operator, literally had to get my wastewater license. Uh, all the things that I didn't learn in my master's, really, I learned in Goliad, Texas. Um, whenever TCQ, which is our regulatory, shows up at, I'm not exaggerating, my home on Christmas Eve to tell me that my wastewater operator was discharging raw water into a river, it's really illegal, by the way. Like, it's like a felony. And so, and I had to go fire a guy at his home on Christmas Eve, and then, by the way, go get a wastewater license because uh, somebody has to run it. That's a whole nother story about bartering suit to train, to pay a guy because I didn't have any money to train my people on how to take the test. It, 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 we could go on for days. So, Goliad, Texas was um, my first gig running a city and had a ball doing it. I then just kept hitting cities. What I've kind of been known for, I know the Austin Business Journal wrote an article about me recently. They call me a serial CEO. I, I don't know if that's good or not. What that means is that I'm highly known to go into cities and, and make some changes and, and then run away. Um, <laughs> next gig, I think it's going to be Nicaragua. We can do Nicaragua. Sure. We'll take it over. We can run Nicaragua. It's done. Um, so, with that, Oh, oh, thank you. So if we're y'all taught in a, in a program. I'm gonna skip this. Y'all know what you're taught in a master program, right? You yeah, know how that goes. That's what I do. Good. Um, I want to share a little bit about this. Um, this bear is in Denver, Colorado. Chris, you remember this bear? Anybody seen this bear? I didn't see the bear. You didn't? It's out. I was at a. Yeah, I, I'll tell you. I was at. Um, that's at the convention center. And in 2002, um, I was teaching high school. And I went up there to see a friend of mine uh, graduate law school. And I'm inside the convention center. And I see this bear. And I hightail it. I see that bear. I'm like on the third floor. And it's doing this, right? And I was like, oh my god, I gotta get by it. Now this is before cell phones. I know table nine and ten don't understand that. But before <laughs> cell phones, so I had to go play everybody. Um, we say in Texas, bless your little heart. That's what we say. Um, so I end up running down and having some poor person off the street take a picture of me in 2002. I might say I look better now, but that's another story. But in 2018, I got to go back and take replicate that. I'll tell you why this is important. Remember, I talk about our story. I remember at that moment thinking to myself that all people, regardless of race, color, gender, socioeconomic, should have access to public art. That was a huge epiphany to me in 2002, where I said, if I can do anything in a city, I want to make sure that they can see a blue bear. I want to make sure that they get to engage in that at whatever walk of life they're in. You don't have to go to a museum to do it. When I got to go back to ASPA in March, I got to revisit my bear. And it was very moving for me that I got to see that. Because I'll tell you, whenever I was in my master's shortly after this, I'm going to tell a story on, on a professor. Actually, he was the dean. When I was in school at the University of Texas, I had a professor tell me that I would never, ever be a city manager. I would like to point out that I've done it four times now. And I think about writing him a letter like a crayon, like the wrong name. Like, I made it. Look at me. And I remember him telling me that. And he said because I was a bad writer. Which is probably true because I hated his class. Okay. So yeah, you win. I'm a bad writer. Okay. Um, and so I, I did go back, though. I went to my city manager at the time and I said, hey, I was told this. Oh my gosh, what do I do? You know, I really thought I'd just figure this out. I remember her telling me, she was like, oh. You're going to write like some memos, some press releases, some agenda items. You're not writing a white paper, ever. <laughs> really, you don't have to. So I remember thinking, because I thought, if I, I didn't know, at that point, if I didn't go join the circus. Like, I really thought, like, oh gosh, I'm not going to do it. And I, I'll, I'll tell you that because I remember then thinking to myself, oh, oh, doctor, if you thought you were the first one to tell me that I couldn't, you got to be kidding, right? So I took that to heart, and it actually empowered me. It became more of my story. It became more of my story of all the times that I was your age that I was told I couldn't. And even in my master told I was couldn't. To, to, uh, three months ago, being told I couldn't on things. A series of my life that says I couldn't do it. And I'll tell you, that was important to me to remember. And maybe to tell you a little side story, his office may or may not have called me a few weeks ago and asked for an interview, and I said, oh, 
you don't need to interview more than I do, but thank you. So I said no, but that's just because I'm vindictive. Yeah. <laughs> that's just that's just vindictive. So, uh, so I talked about knowing your story, but more importantly, knowing your why. Knowing why you do it. I knew very young that I wanted to be a public servant. I knew that. I didn't know at what level. I knew that I wanted to care for and make a community great. I knew, I knew that. I didn't know what role that was. For me, I'm able to do it as a city manager. For you, you may able to do it for me, in many other ways. Um, for me, I get to, the greatest part of being a city manager is I am good at not one thing at all. Terrible, actually, at any one thing. What I'm really good at is being a conductor. What I'm good at is hearing when we're off and knowing we're off key and how to, how to tune it. What I'm not good at is playing the flute. What I'm not good at is focus on one thing. So being a city manager for me, if any of y'all suffer that ADHD like I do, then it's the greatest job ever. So in any given day, in eight hours, I'm gonna to touch on 20 topics, and it's just rapid fire, right? So I make a decent conductor, and I believe the biggest part of being that conductor is that my greatest is being able to step away and draw an applause for those people. My greatest is also that I have to turn my back on the crowd sometimes that sometimes that becomes tough, and turning my back and leading is what I believe I was called to do. And so being a conductor is what I get to do in, in that role. So know why you do it. I think that that's very important. I'm never gonna be a city manager, whatever. <laughs> I can't wait to see him. Never mind, I'll be good. I'll be good. I know where he lives. <laughs> but ain't told you can't, right? So I believe that our number one goal as a leader, well, I'll say in, in my top one, is empowering people. We are not doers of deeds. We are empowers of people. We don't just do deeds. So here was where I was told I can't. About three months ago, I, I, okay, so he, I'll tell you, we're friends here, right? So I go out to work on Saturdays often, and I noticed in the back of City Hall, there were like these random trucks. Those trucks are pretty popular in Texas, right? But random trucks out there, and I'm, I called my police chief, and I was like, hey, I, I, I don't know if they're in City Hall, there's trucks, like in my parking lot, and nobody, you know, we're not open for business. And she's like, oh, uh, she. By the way, let me point that out. My police chief is a female in Texas. This is kind of a big deal. We're the only city that has a female police chief and a female city manager. Whoa, we can cook and no. Um, <laughs> but they let us drive in Texas now. We can vote. We can own the house. I can own a gun. I can run a city. And she gets to carry, carry guns. It's pretty cool stuff. So um, I asked her, I said, man, where are these trucks? And she said, they're just left over from the bar next door. And I was like, what? what? And so what happens is, oh, people will probably have a little too many uh, Dr. Peppers. And then, um, do I have Dr. Pepper? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Ooh, good. Um, I have Dr. Peppers, and then they leave their truck. Well, then I realized there was this city-owned property in between us and the bar. And what people do is they walk through this horrible dirt path. You know, to, to get to their higher truck from their wives. Anyways, so, um, that was that And so I thought to myself, let's just make a really cool park. So I remember I brought it up at first to a couple people, and you wouldn't believe how many people like to just say, say, give excuses to get to know. It's amazing. Like, I love the what if scenarios. I keep a list of them. Actually, I have a poster on my wall of all the times people tell me I can't. Literally, I have a giant, I use government resources really well, and so uh, my engineers made me a poster, and I keep a line at every time somebody tells me I can. It's the a, it's a, it's a greatest thing. It's very empowering. So I was, I said, hey, why do we do this? Oh, well, we already tried that. Oh, good job. Way to hustle. Didn't do anything. And so I got told, we already did it. Cost too much money. What if? What if we build a new city hall? What are you going to do? And so I got told a whole lot of what ifs. So I shared the picture of the two bears with my staff. Because I believe that people need to know your story. That people need to know how you're going to answer something before the question is even asked. Because I believe that whenever people believe in you as a leader and believe in what you believe in, they can move the needle. So I got told a lot of what ifs. And I gave them, I actually, in a portfolio I carry every day to work, are those, those two bear pictures. They're, they're in, they are with me at all times to remind me of my why and to remind me of what I do whenever I, whenever I think about public art and public space, a place where people can laugh, live, play, etc. So I shared that. I said, guys, people should have access. We have the ability to do it. And then I would just typically walk them through a process of what would it look like if we did do it? Don't tell me what it looks like if we don't do it, because I can do that all day. Tell me what does it look like. So I'll tell you what they did. I, I'll play a little brief. 
I would like to point out, though, that I laid on the ground for 13 hours on concrete and painted something. So if y'all ever want to see that, you can find me afterwards. I didn't show it, but but I'm sore. This was just this last weekend. So how do I play this little video? Y'all are looking at me like, oh, I hope she does it. But. Okay, there we go. There's. Like, 
Zephyr and Sons. And I was like, okay, so we had a little bit of education in the community. <laughs> six months when you walk anywhere in my town, they were playing Zephyr and Sons music, you know? And by the time they got there, I'm like, I'm done. So, anyways. So what happened here is um, this wonderful shop owner um, graffiti the ground, and that's Lizzie. It, that's another long story. So Lizzie shows up. So I, I've got a council member that calls me. Do I have any elected officials in the room before I get in trouble? Good. So I have a council member that calls me, and she says, this is graffiti. you got to go do something about it. Okay. So I went outside, and I knew who did it. We know the culprit in a small town. So I went over to Shirley's place. Shirley has a really cool shop downtown, so I started talking to her about it. When my council member said, you need to do something about it, what she didn't know is what I did about it is just create more. And so I, I didn't get rid of it. And we started to allow a whole lot of places. Here's where I kind of feel bad. I don't need to talk to Rhode Island about public art. I'm kind of got it, right? What I will urge you to do in public art is allow people to do it that wouldn't normally do it. I would say that. I don't know if y'all do that or not, but what I learned was allowing high school students to paint any traffic box they wanted. Whatever, paint it. Hey, you know how many people tell me no? Remember that story? I can't say. An engineer came and says, oh, you can't paint it. The box gets too hot. I'm, I'm done. I mean, I just, tell me no one more time and I'm going to do five more. That's what ends up happening. So I get all sorts of no's. So every community, anywhere that I see a wall, the side of a library to me, that's called canvas. Let them do it. Let anybody do it. Um, yarn bombing is one of my new favorite things. If you can't sleep tonight, I want you to Google yarn bombing. It kind of started in Austin. If you haven't seen it, it's really cool. So what you do is you, you, you I don't know, they crochet stuff. I don't know. So the high school kids, we actually got them a grant that made it, had this machine that crocheted random. I mean, you could crochet a tank if you wanted to, right? Ryan, you could do a big humvee. Anyway, so crochet whatever you want. Um, and then you just unleash the children. Just let them yarn about it. So we actually had them do a lot at night so that people woke up on a Saturday and the town is colorful. Let them do it. What I also love in Oklahoma were inmates. I learned really quick that I could buy Gatorade in every flavor and pizza and maybe some tobacco. No law enforcement. Oh, it's WGs. <laughs> you can buy inmates anything. They work for me all day. So we paint. And then this guy right here. He actually was my handyman at my house. He looks like Charles Manson, but not as the facial tattoo. But um, so what I learned is that if people are asked to do something in a community, we want to serve. They say that less than one percent of your community is engaged in the making of the community, and the other ninety-nine percent are the consumers. Think about that. My town is sixty-seven thousand. They say that I should have six hundred seventy people engaged in the community. I'm gonna tell you, I don't think I do. It's the same people at the chamber, you know, everything I go to, right? And I think about that. And then there's some interesting research that says that cities that are in love with their city, in other words, you have community engagement, extremely high, do very well in performance of economic development. Think about that. You love your city, you perform better. Less than 1% is making that happen. How do you engage that to be an actual 1%? Maybe even a 2%. Let's get crazy. So this one, I don't know if you know National. Have you ever heard of Parking Day? This is where we take a, a random parking space and turn it into a park. And yeah, that's me doing a ribbon cutting from a parking space. And, and this is back to letting people know your idea and then letting them run with it. All of these things are just stuff from my house. Like literally, that's really just crap I pulled from the backyard and then brought it to work that day. So those are things that people want to engage in. Attorneys, I'm gonna go back to attorneys on this one. So I remember I, I became friends with a coffee shop owner, and he said, hey, sweetie, we want to we wanna ride bicycles in the middle of the street. Okay, that's what the street's for. We build it for you to do whatever in it. But we want to dress up in costumes. Okay. And I think he was waiting for me to say no. Like, it got to the point, like, okay, well, can you get a police escort? We're going to ask the whole community to ride their bikes downtown on Friday nights. Oh, okay, I'm still with you. Yeah, we do that. And then it got to me, he's like, he says, well, we then want to show a movie at a city park. Well, that's when attorneys get involved, because you can't really show a movie, because you have to have, like, a copyright blah, blah. I said, how about this? I got a projector at my house. How about we show a movie at your place at the coffee shop? Because it's, yeah, I'm not liable, and so I don't really care. So anyways, they started doing that, so that's an every Friday night deal. When people come to you and say, I want to do something for my community that engages people and has those people love their community, guess what your answer should be? Sure. We'll figure it out, right? What do a lot of people, I think, in government like to do? Figure out how to say no. <coughs> how to say, oh, well, what if? What, what, what if somebody wears an inappropriate costume, Serena? What if that happens? 
art walks. Oh, here's what I love is off-duty, no, not off-duty, light-duty police officers. They don't have anything to do. So one dressed up like an Easter bunny. So I, I'll give them something to do. I'll find something. So what I love the community, too, that I get to do is that I have the opportunity to do. Right, my friend Josh, you got that? Is that I, I was able to go to an elementary school on Fridays, and the, the kids would read to me. I only did 30 minutes on a Friday. But for about three years, I worked with the second grade class. Uh, they hopefully kept going. A new class. Okay, so for three years. And I remember reading once that Mother Teresa said that nothing that we do for others is truly altruistic. There's always intrinsic value, right? And what I learned from what I would say was serving others for that 30 minutes, what it really did was it empowered me to see things from a different line. And it, it empowered me to see the world from a very different lens. And so being able to do that and to serve, and what I learned quickly is having your employees have the opportunity to do that. So I've just implemented a policy with my staff that says I want you to go serve in the community for 40 hours a year on city's money. I don't want you to go pick up trash. I wouldn't be paying you to do that. What I want you to do is engage. What I want you to do is be the Easter Bunny. What I want you to do is go see people, and like Morbea said, you meet people where they are, and you go see them. Our employees and staff should be able to do that, is what I do. This is great. Remember the lady that drew Lizzie? Mm -hmm. We were bringing Mumford and Sons, and she called me. She says, hey, can I, uh, can I paint a giant British flag in the largest intersection downtown? So um, guess what I said? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know why people in Oklahoma wouldn't want a British flag painted on their <laughs> Okay. So, um, so Facebook did its thing and went crazy, and I, I was almost fired. And then what I learned is that people forget things really quick. Because here's what ends up happening. We paint a British flag. The town goes nuts. And then we brought 35,000 people to town. They quickly forget what that did in the economy of a small town. Um, oh, and I'll tell you, if you never know, if you can't find your firefighters at a festival and it's 100 degrees up, they're out here shooting people with water. So that's what they're doing. I, there's a little wet shirt contest. I just, it, sometimes I just, I just do this. <laughs> Whatever police and fire is doing, I don't want to know. I just turn that away. Um, so that event um, was amazing. I'll tell you a funny story about that event. Because I don't want you to, to think that we didn't do a lot of planning for it. So I managed a small town, remember? I have four jail beds. Four. four. I have 35,000 people coming down there. I come in a town that probably are going to be altered in mind some way. Pro probably, right? So I come to a concert. It's a festival. You have to spend the night in a tent. Okay. So I got four jail beds, two cells. So I also had a gender thing. So I can only have like two girls, two boys arrested, right? That's it. So we made some rules before it. We decided that in the state of Oklahoma, you could detain people for up to eight hours, you know, pretty much without reason, pretty much. And so uh, we decided to make a timeout area. So if you were hammered and we thought you were going to cause harm to yourself or someone else, we would just ask you, would you like to go to jail or would you like to go to timeout? And so we made a timeout area by the stage. It was fenced, it had a corn potty, it had water, it had shade. And I had more fun watching the drunks teach each other how to dance than I did at the actual show. And so I'll tell you, it was one of the greatest things ever. And it's back to finding out how to get to guests. So my sheriff of town, so we had sheriff's office for the county and city police, right? And my sheriff had a jail. And he absolutely said to me, I'm not taking any of your people this weekend. I mean, I was flat out told, good luck, unless they murder somebody, we're not housing them. So we had to come up with time out tank, right? I remember one old boy, he finally woke up, and he's like, kind of belligerent. He's like, what? Why am I in here? And I'll never forget it. He, my cop said, like, well, uh, sir, you laid down on the highway. And he's like, I was tired. <laughs> that happened, and then you know the Daily Oklahoman said it was uncommonly great behavior on part of the audience and cooperation on fronts, and I'll tell you what, we ended up arresting uh, six people that weekend. One of them came with the band. I would just like to point that out. But, um, so it wasn't my people. And we normally would arrest like 20 people on a weekend, so arresting six for 35000 I'm going to call the win in my business, right? So for all the people out there that are like, oh, she's crazy, trust me, it was six months of planning. Six months of setting up a inst joint instant command, setting up everything that we needed to do to make that, that party go well. We had a train that bifurcated the city. That train was active. 
And I know I had 35,000 people probably drinking, and that was quite quite an issue that we dealt with. So it's not like we just throw parties. We throw really, really good planned parties. Um, what that led to was every Friday night party and shutting down the streets. Back to getting the yes. I had a list of ordinances in the city that basically would allude to not being able to do this. And I remember the day that I went to my city council and with 12 ordinances and said, y'all should just kind of get rid of these. Like, let's just set them on fire. But, so being able to show those elected officials, like, I get it that you think this is smart in ordinance, but you're prohibiting this. And what are you doing? You're prohibiting that community engagement and that love. Here's the thing. I can fill potholes all day. I can spend millions doing potholes. You know, people call and complain about potholes, right? Seems to be a big deal. What I've learned is if I fill every single pothole in the community, they still be like, no, it's all right. They don't get excited. That doesn't create community engagement. That doesn't create people to love their cities. It, it, it's, it's where you're going to put your money in a community I think is really important. So where are we at on time, Ryan? You're my timekeeper. You go. You just keep going. Just keep going. Ooh, I got three hours of material. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to eat. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> my dad was a preacher, you know. Good oh, good. So I'll tell you, so uh, things that I do with the, my employees, because like I said, guys, remember back to, it's not me. It's the people that, that I get the opportunity to work with every day that carry this out. I don't actually do much. You know, I can do it, right? That's what I do. And so with them, I'll tell you, everything that I can do that's cheesy. Here was my former police chief. I remember him calling one day, can we dress up like rednecks and do a 5K? Sure, hard, whatever. <laughs> sure you can. That's my current police chief. Um, anyways, just having a good time. What I believe in, in my organization, organizations that I run, is that I start doing representative democracy with employees. So we set up a lot of committees. So I now have, oh, we put P words in front of all F words in Cleaverville because it's PF. So all F words get it. Like, I'm sure we're thinking festival, fantastic, fun, family, football. So all of it's PS, firecrackers. Um, and so we have the fun committee. We have all sorts of P words in front of F words. And so they get to do whatever they want to do. So I tell them, like, okay, here's the deal, guys. You get like, I don't know, 14 hours a year on city time to party. So do whatever you want. So a few weeks ago, we had field day. Put field day. We had put field day. So put field day is um, me getting uh, completely sabotaged with about 100 water balloons is what ended up happening. I think that's why they did the event is to, to attack me. But it's about empowering your people all the time. Here's the thing, guys. If you aren't intentional about being that leader at whatever level you are, who else is? Who else is doing that? Who else is being intentional about how we communicate to each other and how we get our communities to engage and to love each other? And I believe that's at all levels. I, I, I believe that you can be the intentional leader and make those things happen. Once again, that's all I do. They do, well, I do force things. Like this was a former police chief and I just called him and said, you have to dress up like an elf. And, and he did. And, and then I dunk him. I, I'm terrible actually, my employees. What do you think, Deputy Chief? Okay, okay, <laughs> probably not. I started doing um, carpool karaoke with my current chief, but here's our problem. We don't know the words to any song. <laughs> and so it goes on Facebook. We're just, it, 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 it's awful. It's actually a terrible idea. So I tell you, I have a whole lot of really bad ideas. Some of them stick. My secretary says, Serena, on any given day, you have about 70 ideas, and one is good. I'll take it. I'll take the one, right? So keep coming up with those, right? You'll, you'll find ones that stick. I experienced Hurricane Harvey. How many of y'all are familiar uh, with Harvey that happened? Okay. So Harvey was uh, a little over a year ago. I was serving on the coast. Um, to be to be personal with you, my home uh, was on the water, and it took in about 10 feet uh, of water. So my first floor went completely submerged. The way that I left my home was standing on my balcony and stepping over my rail into a boat and going to work at the emergency operations center. And I say that not for something. I say that because I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So my life got really rocked during that time. But what are we supposed to do as leaders? We empower the others. We put that mask a little bit on ourselves, look at the home, say, i got to leave it, and then go take care of your people. What happened was my community and my staff, at the time I probably had about 250 employees, probably a quarter of them were, were living out of hotels. Their houses are demolished. I have a picture of one of my employees that was on top of his roof with his wife um, and his three kids and his dog waiting for, for rescue and watching that water get up to the gutters. He showed up to work 12 hours later and worked 24-hour shifts for the next week. 
it, 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 it's amazing what people will do when called to serve. Um, so whenever the newspaper and I, about day five, I was a little cranky. And uh, the newspaper called me to kind of, you know, rub. And I lost it a little bit. And I said, look at my people. Look at who's here. Look who's serving. Don't tell me we did something wrong right now. So um, they don't let me be the PIO very often because I say terrible things to the, the media. So, um, <laughs> but with that, what I realized about three weeks into it, man, my troops are tired. They're tired. They're, they're broken. They are dealing with lost cars. They're dealing with unbelievable things. And so what happened was, this is fantastic. The custodial staff didn't show up. I mean, you can, it, it's just crazy. Just picture you know, an entire 200 miles just completely de devastated. And so I didn't have custodial staff. And there was a dead cricket. He's actually right there. And there was a dead cricket in the city hall girls' bathroom. And one of my employees put a little sign up. And it said, this, this cricket is dead. Or, I'm dead. Please pick me up. Or and I go to the bathroom, and I see this sign, and I am rolling. Like, rolling. And I'm like, we need to have a memorial for the cricket. <laughs> yeah. And so so we ended up, that's me and my foreign police chief. We had flowers. We had candlelight vigil. And so at City Hall, we decided, and we wrote an entire obituary for them. And then, I mean, we did crime tape. The cops went nuts. And, like, we decided, we did a full eulogy of Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy the cricket, may he rest in peace. But then the cops had to spin it. And the cops said he was a known criminal. And so then people weren't as excited about it. It was a whole ordeal. And so, um, I mean, I'm at the store at 6 a.m. buying flowers for a stupid cricket, right? <laughs> and so why I tell you that story, it's about being intentional when your people are hurting, how to bring them out. I noticed on some of my employees that post on Facebook that it's the funniest thing they've ever done at work, right? And at times that they're hurting, it is our job to pick up and to support. So that was Jimmy, Jimmy the cricket. So I often stay awake at night thinking, what could I do in a city, right? <laughs> So soon. My favorite is signage. When I walked into a city of uh, Guthrie, Oklahoma, there were these signs up. That all downtown is a beautiful downtown. It, it's the largest historic downtown actually in the United States. It's stunning. But we had all these signs up that probably attorneys made. And what they said were, no skateboarding, no bicycling, no fun, we'll execute you, ordinance 4.8, <laughs> section B, whatever, stupid signs, right? And so the first thing I did was take them down. In my community, what do I want people to see? The first word ain't no. The first word is going to be yes, and let's do it. And so like, whenever I see signs that say no public restrooms, I'll go give a store owner a new sign and be like, public oh, restrooms are located at Main Street and Fourth, you know, or something. Because I don't want no to be all over the city. So we dropped all those signs and then painted on the ground because I went and said, like a good policymaker that I am, I went and said, why do we have stupid signs or everywhere they look terrible? And, you know, the staff is like, well, the skateboarders. Like, there's terrible skateboarders out wreaking havoc. I never saw a skateboarder there. I have no idea what I'm talking about. And so, like, so I said, well, if I'm a skateboarder, I'm not going to look up in the air about 10 feet. I'm going to look at the ground because that's probably where my face is about to get planted. So we end up doing, you know, signs on the ground. My favorite goes this one. That's in Seattle. Do not drop your cigarette butts on the ground. Fish crawl out and not to smell them. And we're trying to get them to quit. So we started doing some funny signage, a funny signage of Hoover Bill as well. Um, this uh, this is one of my favorites. Those are those are just a, that's in Seattle. Um, I actually sat and watched that. I took that picture and I sat there and watched people walk over it. I just sat on the bench because I love watching how people engage in space. And people would try to start dancing. They have no idea how to do it, right? And then what happens? Their buddy starts filming it so they can put it on Snapchat, right? Because we've got to, you know, document everything we do in society now. And so, you know, they did that. But here's what I'm thinking from the economic development side. I could drive by that. And when you drive by somewhere, sometimes you see something new and you're like, oh, I'll put that on list to it later. But if I'm walking it, I'm going to stop and I'm not going to that store. I'm going to engage for a lot longer time. So you don't put stuff on you own it. You as a city own it. You own that, that sidewalk. Do whatever you want with it. Paint it. Put some dance steps in it. Whatever you want. Now, my traffic guys are a little mad at me right now because I want them to do that. And then cops have to come and tell me, well, and then the attorney shows up. So we'll be doing this soon. But I'm just, I got to get them to yes without telling them to do it. We're working on it. What else can I do? You all sorts of stuff, right? The yard bombing. Oh, I love it. Love it. So this eyeball is in Dallas, Texas. Um, the artist was out of Chicago. 
And I read an article on him. He was a very quiet man. And he just, I remember his, his exact words were, he said, it, like, everybody's amazed by it. It's a really big eyeball. I don't know how we're going to source this. It's like a banner, right? And every time I go to Dallas, I am that cheese ball that makes people pull over and let me go look at the eyeball. It, it, it is absolutely inspiring for me. And so I look at this eyeball. It's technically on private property. It's a private owned. But what happened there? Businesses started developing around it. Why? Because a whole lot of other people got a car and look at the eyeball, right? I'm not the only one. It's like touching the bean in Chicago. And so we create space by which people can can look at it. That eyeball, my staff knows I can't think big eyeball, go bigger. Go much bigger than what we think of. You can put a giant suit of eyeball in the middle and you wouldn't believe the impact it has on the community. I do love that big eyeball. <laughs> I'm working on this. I gotta put that somewhere. <laughs> I'll close a little bit. I have stories all day, but I'll tell you, you as public servants, what I do know, I've been doing this for about 15 years, um, a little before that in teaching. We don't burn out because we, um, we don't burn out because, um, sorry, I'm so sorry, guys. I got a little emotional. I love what I do. I love this. Y'all, y'all are going to be amazing. Public servants don't burn out because of what they do. They burn out because we forget why we do it. Know your why. Know that one story does not determine who you are. It's a series of stories. Shape that. Share your message. People want to hear it. Leadership is all about engagement of relationships. Know your why. Tell your story. People want to hear it. And I'll tell you always, do it scared. And come to Texas for free hugs. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. As we say back home, hot damn. <laughs> I told uh, I told everybody after meeting her last night she was a spark plug, and you, boy, oh boy. Um, there may be people in this room old enough to remember the In Search of Excellence movement in the, in the 80s. It was led by a guy named Tom Peters, and he used to go around telling people to do what Serena has just been describing. He quit. He quit doing it. And he quit doing it because nobody would listen. Listen to the woman. Now, Q and A. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Questions for uh, City Manager Breland, please. Ms. Flurry. I'll be more stories. Hi, I really enjoyed your um, theme of empowering others and leading in that manner. I wanted to know where. What's the origin of that for you? Um. It wasn't Tom Peters, was was it? (laughs) So, um, I'll I'll tell you, I grew up in a... a, a, We all go back to our roots, right? We we all have those stories. So mine was about a a father that... I was an athlete growing up. I mean, you know, relatively. I mean, you know, gained a couple pounds, whatever. But um, whenever I was younger, I played baseball, volleyball, basketball. Those were my sports. And um, at about second grade, my dad was on a baseball team. And I remember showing up, baseball, not softball, baseball team. And I remember showing up and I was like, I am the only one with pigtails, right? So I am the one female. Mm-hmm. I never thought about that until about three years ago. And I asked my dad, I said, hey, remember that team I was on, it was all boys? I was like, did they just let me on that team? And he said, what I said, no, no, I threatened people. And so <laughs> yeah, I had people paved the way for me before I knew they were paid in. And I realized quickly that I needed to pave that way. Um, I started a committee called the Unbeatable Committee. I went and asked my organization, what's the top 10 things you would change about the organization? Which is a scary question to ask. Be prepared for what they tell you. Be prepared to make change, right? My organization came back about 275 things that changed about the organization. I was a little terrified. And I created a committee called the Unbeatable Committee, and I said, no manager is allowed. I have the most beautiful story of a meter reader he um, came up to me, and I asked that he be on it. It's a young African-American man that I see potential in, but I don't think he sees it himself. And I said, I want that man on, on that committee. I didn't really know him. He shows up to the first committee meeting, and I'm there, and he says, he pulls me aside, and I notice he changed his clothes. He got out of his city uniform, and he put on a Sunday vest. And he walks up to me, and he says, hey, I want to um, get a picture with you. Very mild. I said, sure, we'll do that. we we'll take a picture. And the man tears up and he says, no one has ever asked me to be at the table. Nobody's ever asked me to do something like this, and I want to share the picture with my family because I'm so proud. When you, when you have the ability to do something as simple 
as put someone on a committee and watch them shine, that empowerment is beyond fulfilling. And what you're doing is creating. So I'll, I'll tell you, my origin would probably be people did it for me. And, and I'm going to give that, that back. I had another gentleman, and I'll tell you real quick, I, uh, I started a benefits committee. Once again, no supervisors. My fleet mechanic leads the committee. He was chosen by the committee. I have a, a fleet mechanic come into my office, and they gave me their top 20 things they wanted to do. And he went through them, and again, so I have never been asked to do anything but turn wrenches. And he's setting policy for the organization on insurance benefits. Ignore your, you know, here's what we do. 10% of the organizations are superstars. You know, the ones that you go to over and over to do things, because they're going to do it. What are you doing? And then you've got 10% that are body dwellers that just need to be fired, right? Literally. So you got like top 10, bottom 10. What's your 80 doing? Go tap them. Empower them. And what's stronger organization than wearing out your 10% and then spending all your time dealing with the 10%? Fire them at the bottom. That's what I would say. All the HR people are like, <laughs> Anyone else? Serena? Yes. Ms. Bergadamo. Um, so, a lot of your, um, your, your speech reminded me of um, uh, Parks and Rec. <laughs> and, and just how forceful and, and positive the main character was and how much change you can enact that way. Um, on the opposite side of the of that picture are the lawyers who are there largely to protect you. Yeah. Yeah, but like yes. Essentially they're protecting you from litigation yeah. from there's always a couple of crab apples and then they're all apples. So how like I mean, how do you deal with the crab apples? I've sat in federal court for nine days on a case on water. I've sat in district court against one of my council members. The council member sued the city. I was the defendant for the city against my boss. Let me tell you how that goes. So, um, did that in Oklahoma. That was a joy. She believed that the right of the people was to vote on how much the water bill was. I didn't agree with that. Um, uh, so, I think I think for me, when it especially is legal, my city attorney, all the city attorneys I've had are very close, and they, they get me, and they're just going to give they're going to tell me, I, sh I, should, I shouldn't make fun of them so much. They're pretty good with me on saying, here's your liability of getting sued, and if you get sued, how much is it? I hate to say that, but that's, that's the risk that you take, is calculated risk or everything that we do. I mean, I, yeah, I, I constantly get asked, yeah, like, where do you get sued? Well, we don't really get sued that often on little stuff. It's big stuff, like who serves water. I mean, we're talking million dollar deals I get sued on. But um, when it comes to HR, yeah, I've, I've had, um, oh gosh, 15 suits filed against? Sure. I mean, it's a common, but here's my thing. I could get real scared and not move the needle. And if we all said we're scared to do something, and it goes back to my daddy saying, just you do it, scared. Figure it out. I sat in a meeting the other day. I was a little disheartened. Um, I'm, I've only been there eight months at this city. And I didn't even mean to go there. That's a whole other story. I was asked to interview, and I told them no for about five months. And then I kind of felt sorry for them. I shouldn't say that. But the council members will tell you, it was the oddest interview. I was actually really mean to them. I kind of, I called them names, actually. I said they were ineffective, they pontificate, and the only people that watch your meetings are your wives. I said that in an interview. I mean, I, I said that. And then they said, well, we know that you didn't want to be here, or why are you here now? And my response was, because you need me. For whatever reason, they offered me a job, right? So now whenever I, I am kind of bold with them, I'm like, you, you knew it. Like you, you, you knew what you hired. And so I think it's also being consistent with that message of if you don't move the needle, if you keep telling me why it's no, then get someone else. But because I'm not going to sit back and be status quo. I know this sounds really crazy, but status quo is heavy in my heart. When I, when I see status quo, so the other day, one of my employees says, there's this guy in town, and he bought a gator. A twenty thousand dollar play toy, and he's going down to the river and he's cleaning it up. What do we do? And I was like, I don't. I really don't understand the question. You give him a badge and you put a sign on his, you know, gator that says, "I'm part cleanup dude" or whatever. But it's back to that thinking of like, oh gosh, we can't. And then they said, "What the what ifs?" Oh, it made me crazy. What if another person wants to do it? Make a club. You, all of them. He's the president. They clean up the car. Fantastic. And so they really, but here's the thing, is don't confuse pushback 
with pessimism. And that's why I've had to learn that in the past so many years, is that I used to think pushback was, was pessimistic. And what I realized is I want you to push back. I want you to challenge those ideas to each other, and we don't attack the person, we attack the problem, and so I'm focusing on not push back, not doing that. So I still get it all the time with my staff, they're learning. I mean, you know, because you, I want to get them to the point where they don't even ask. They'll be like, yeah, so you want somebody to clean up the park for free. Of course, that makes sense. But if they're thinking liability, because what it is, what they're thinking is, we don't allow, there's a policy, there's a law, whatever, ordinance, so like a bunch of policy makers in the room, that you can't have motorized vehicles on our trail. So immediately, this guy got, a, you know, they got a gator, and so my staff's like, oh my gosh, they're breaking a rule. And I'm thinking, dude, figure it out. Like, let them do it. Like, do a little waiver. I don't know, make them sign a document. Do whatever the attorneys make you do, but get to yes. Why would I tell someone in my community that loves my community so much that he spent $20,000 on a gator to clean up my park? I'm going to tell him no. Uh-uh, I'm going to say get friends. Does that make any sense? Show me that. Or <laughs> recently, this one was funny. I told him, we need to do some lunch and learns. Let's eat together. Bring in speakers. I don't care what the topic is. Just let's learn together, right? And so I brought it up to my senior staff, and one person that's been there 807 years, she was like, well, 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 if only 25 people can go to it, well, what if I have five people that want to go? And, and, and then it was so funny to watch the engineer, the engineer actually of all people, looks over and was like, figure it out, draw straws, do whatever. And I'm like, bam, that's it. You know, it's about getting, because if I listen to all the people that said, oh, what if, what, what if that's a problem? We would, we ain't going to move the needle. Ms. Braylon? Mm, thank you. My colleague. That was a hell of a performance, wasn't it? <laughs> we never let our um, keynote speakers leave without a gift. Thank you. This was for you. Thank you. And so remember. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.